Can you hear me? Oh, hey! Me. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Georgia Tsar and I represent the International Passive House Association. We're here today to talk about the icebox challenge that took place in Glasgow earlier this year, the results of that experiment and the future thereof. But first, what is the International Passive House Association? We are a global network of passive house stakeholders uh, covering the entire range of construction and design professionals. We have well over 5,000 members worldwide, representing over 50 countries, with 22 membership organizations across the world as well. And you'll hear from one of those organizations, the Passive House Trust, later today. 
This year, in 2021, we decided to put together a joint campaign focusing on the importance of energy efficiency as a renewable energy. We wanted to highlight the vital role that it plays in our built environment and, of course, in meeting our climate goals. The, uh, the campaign works to highlight that Passive House is replicable, that we can achieve it worldwide, and, of course, that it is thus global. And it really falls into our uh, association motto, just changed of its own accord, uh, think global, act local. So why efficiency first? I'm sure after two weeks at COP, you're all aware that the IPCC is highlighting that substantial action is needed to prevent further global warming. But what you may not be aware of is just what a huge role buildings play in that equation. Currently, 35% of uh, carbon emissions, or global energy consumption, apologies, come specifically from the building sector. And the bulk of that is during the operational stage of the building or when it is in use. And when we break that down, we see that most of that energy demand is stemming from heating and cooling. So it makes sense to look into reducing that fast. And to help you on your way to think efficiency fast, we've produced a range of videos, flyers, we've run competitions, we've written in-depth articles, there's infographics, and a whole range of other things in over 20 languages, including French, Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic, Russian, and Spanish. You can find your local information on, your localized information on your local association's website, or you can find the entire list on our own. So another thing I have to cover before I hand over to the rest of the speakers is what is the Passive House standard? Well, Passive House is at its heart a performance-based standard for highly energy efficient buildings. Passive House buildings uh, result in about a 90% reduction in heating demand when, or, and an 80% reduction in cooling demand as compared to conventional builds. And we achieve this by making use of passive sources, as the name would suggest, for heating, such as the sun's rays, or cooling, such as opening the window when it's cooler at night, or uh, shading the building properly. And this results in higher levels of comfort and air quality, and of course also lowered running costs and lowered energy use, and thus lowered emissions. And you can really think about this as a passive house as a thermos, holding in all of that heat, avoiding any breaks in the thermal envelope where air can either penetrate from the outside or escape from the inside and change the inter internal temperature. Um, versus a coffee machine, which is not a really effective way to keep your coffee warm, and it's certainly not an effective way to keep your house warm. I should mention at this point, however, that Passive House is not just for houses, although that name would suggest it. We do, it, we do Passive House buildings for residential and, of course, for non-residential, including schools, swimming pools, and newly a hospital. Passive House, the standard, is not a brand. It is not a design standard. It is a performance standard, which means it can be implemented across any climate. The key is to make sure that the design meets the criteria uh, according to the local specifications or the, the local climate conditions. We also note that Passive House is a match made in heaven with renewables because if you have a highly energy efficient building, you need a lot less renewables to keep it warm, cool, and your appliances running. So we have different levels of integration of that too. And we have the Enerfit standard for passive house retrofits, where we recognize, of course, that it's not always easy to achieve passive house, the traditional or classic standard, which is aimed at new builds for existing buildings. There are already some complications there, so we make allowances for uh, buildings that are in the process of being renovated. And whether you do that as one deep retrofit or step by step, there are always ways to make that happen. So Passive House at its core has five main principles, and those are air tightness and a thermal bridge reduced design, which are those pesky holes allowing for uh, thermal penetration of the building. And of course, because you've got an airtight building, you're going to need some mechanical ventilation so that we can all breathe and we don't have increased moisture damage in the building. We also look for Passive House windows. In Scotland, that would mean triple glazing. In other climates, double glazing might suffice and of course, climate-appropriate thermal insulation. 
And when we achieve these, uh, these principles and we, we put them to work at the level that they meet the passive house criteria, then we benefit not only from a high level of comfort, but also from a building that will last. It's not affected by mold and moisture damage. Especially in these times of COVID, we benefit from the continuous filtered fresh air and the building performing as planned, so you know that your building is what you invested in. And most importantly, when we're talking about investments, they're cost effective over their life cycle. You're not throwing money at constant huge heating bills and in the future, as things get warmer, potentially also cooling bills. So the Passive House Institute has developed key contributors to achieve Passive House buildings. There are a range of training courses for the professionals. Uh, there's a range of design tools for the energy balance calculation and to design and also work with BIM modeling. We certify components to make the architect's life easy so they don't need to do the guesswork. And of course, we certify the buildings to make sure that you are getting what you wanted. And that has resulted in over 3 million square meters of Passive House certified buildings worldwide. Uh, there are many more that are not certified. Of course, we recommend it, but as it is an open standard, you're welcome to go passive and, and you don't need to feel forced to certify. So finally, over to the Icebox Challenge. The Icebox Challenge is a public experiment. We use it to demonstrate the benefits of energy efficient buildings uh, and do it in a scientifically accurate and engaging way for the public. Here you can see the picture. There's a cubic meter of ice placed in each box. And as you'll note here, one box is built to the Scottish building standard, while the other met the international passive house standard as appropriate for Scotland. The two boxes were then filled with a cubic meter of ice, which is 917 uh, kilos, and were placed on St. Enix Square for two weeks. Uh, that was over July, August, the last two weeks of the summer school holidays. The amount of ice left in the box at the end of the two weeks was then measured and the level remaining was used to demonstrate how well each box kept out the heat. We used knowledge gained from previous ice box challenges in places like Germany, Canada and the US to put together our challenge for Scotland. Um, and we also ran it as a student competition to engage with the youth, but Julio, my colleague, will talk about that in more detail. So important to note is that while the boxes look exactly the same, except for the color scheme perhaps, they're very, very different inside. We use different quality windows, we use different insulation levels, and we paid more attention to detail to stop those thermal bridges. And that made all the difference. And that was especially noticeable in this summer when we had a heat wave, and we noticed that the Scottish building standard is just not up to par with the climate mitigation and adaption that we're going to need to do in the future uh, to make sure that we're not having overheating issues in our buildings and to also make sure that they are able to withstand increasing global temperatures. So last few things. Why the icebox challenge? Well, Energy efficiency can sometimes be quite hard to grasp. It's an invisible concept, really. We benefit from it, the environment benefits from it, but we can't see energy efficiency unless we're looking at lowered bills, maybe. So because of that, although we know that highly energy efficient buildings reduce the bills for heating and cooling, and they reduce the demand for energy and thus have a much less carbon intensive, it's sometimes hard to make that clear to the public. And so the Icebox Challenge makes the invisible visible. It's a fun and engaging way to make the intangible, and, an intangible and often abstract concept open and clear for those who might not be engaged in the building industry. And Glasgow was selected, as uh, Michelle will tell us in a moment, because the Glasgow City Council has been promoting, and the local housing associations as well, sorry, have been promoting the Passive House standard. They've been using it in retrofit projects, especially social housing, across the city and the region. They were very, very supportive and we're very grateful to the council for making the, uh, the Icebox Challenge possible, especially as the host city of COP26, as we wanted to bring attention to this topic in the lead up to it. 
and of course donations of time and skill and of course components to make the building were all, the buildings were also necessary and we had a lot of support in Glasgow from local manufacturers, local passive house designers and other enthusiastic and passionate people. So I'll leave it to the others to talk about it in detail but <laughs> As you can see, the results were quite staggering. All the ice melted in the Scottish box after just 11 days. Uh, so by the Monday, it was completely empty in the Scottish box. And so when we opened the box on Friday, August 6, uh, it was mostly dry while the Passive House box still retained 121 kilos. So a real difference there. I'm going to hand over to Michelle, who is going to talk about the amazing work that Glasgow is doing. Uh, so over to Michelle Mundy, who is the Head of Housing for Glasgow City Council. Oh. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I am delighted to be here today um, and very proud that Glasgow was the host of the Icebox Challenge this summer. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you today is about our journey to net zero. Um, Glasgow's history and past industrialisation are deeply etched into our buildings and our landscape. We face some of the most difficult and persistent challenges tackling poor health, poverty, inequalities that affect many people within our communities. So why do we seek to build better? It is fundamentally about improving lives for all Glasgow's people, creating suitable, affordable and sustainable homes and flourishing neighbourhoods and communities that provide the essential foundations for health, well-being and prosperity. I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of what we've achieved and some of our future ambitions. We're aiming for nothing less than a fundamental shift in how we think about and deliver better homes to create inclusive and sustainable communities across Glasgow. For us, 2017 was a turning point. We were inspired after attending a Passive House conference in London and seeing the potential for change, we realised that this was a journey that we had to make. So the city set out to embrace the principles of Passive House to deliver for the people of Glasgow to re help reduce our carbon emissions, fuel poverty and health inequalities. And from this was born the Glasgow Standards. And I'll just... So, Glasgow is the strategic housing authority for the city. Um, we set the standards and manage public funding for the development of new affordable homes. In September 2018, Glasgow City Council established new requirements for all new built housing. We called this the Glasgow Standard. It sets high levels for internal and external space, accessibility and sustainability. As a result, our homes provide more livable spaces, suitable to meet the range of diverse needs, and they are extremely energy efficient and affordable to heat. One of the sustainability options put in place as part of this policy was to develop to the Passive House Certified Standard. This was a catalyst. It has propelled the ambitions of our housing association partners who have em embraced the standards and the potential for change in delivering zero carbon homes. And I'd like to share with you some examples. So this project, completed in 2019 by Shettleston Housing Association, was one of the first affordable housing developments in Scotland to achieve passive house status. It is located within a densely built up busy area in the heart of the East End community. We identified a local need for more affordable housing suitable for older people. This innovative project combined retrofit and new builds and applying the Glasgow standard was designed to provide easy access for people with mobility needs and built to ensure minimum energy was required for heat and power. Traditional skills such as stone masonry were married with modern methods of construction using off-site manufacturing to achieve a stunning and multi-award winning development. The next project is just down the road from, from the one in Shettleston. In 2014, Glasgow hosted the 20th Commonwealth Games. The Athletes Village was rightly celebrated as a centrepiece of the Regeneration Master Plan and is now home to over 700 Glasgow tenants and residents living in a bright, vibrant, sustainable community. Work continues to transform the, the area 
and this is the latest landmark project at Springfield Cross. Provided by West of Scotland Housing Association, this six-storey development of 36 homes is located on the edge of the Commonwealth Games Village, next door to Celtic Park and the Emirates Arena. Built to pacify standards, it is an ultra-low energy building requiring minimum energy for heat and cooling, which means low fuel bills for tenants. Dundas Hill, pictured here, overlooks the city to the north. In the 19th and early 20th century, it was a centre for trade and industry founded on the Great Canal, the world's first man-made sea to sea canal and home to what was once the world's largest whisky distillery. The last whisky distillery closed in 2011 and the buildings were demolished, leaving a series of large level terraces and the remnants of a former building on a 27 acre site. Dundas Hill is one of a series of major regeneration sites that will transform the north of Glasgow over the next 20 years and provide over 3,000 new homes for people and families and reconnect North Glasgow with the heart of the city. The Dundas Hill Master Plan will deliver 600 new homes, including 90 affordable new built homes to Passive House Standard, which will be Glasgow's largest Passive House project to date. The size of this development is crucial as it demonstrates the potential to deliver at scale. But we're not stopping there. In the future, Cow Layers will perhaps become noted as the pivotal project within Glasgow's long-term housing programme. It's certainly our most ambitious. Once the site of major railway works, this area suffered following the city's rapid deindustrialisation and over four de decades it has languished and fallen into dereliction. The Regeneration Master Plan will revive and transform this area. We propose to create an entire new neighbourhood and community with 750 zero carbon homes. We believe this will be the first such residential development of this size in the UK. Our aim is that the development at this scale will generate a lasting step change in capacity and skills in the construction industry and local supply chains to deliver zero carbon homes for the future. And finally, I must also talk about perhaps the biggest challenge Glasgow and Scotland face in meeting carbon reduction targets. That is transforming our existing homes. Around a quarter of all Scots live in traditional sandstone tenement housing, much of which was built over 100 years ago. Glasgow alone is estimated to have more than 70,000 tenement flats. These buildings have significant cultural and heritage value. For many Glaswegians, they define the look and feel of the city. They're all also essential for meeting our existing and future housing needs and demand. However, Many are in a bad state of repair and the solid wall construction provides poor, poor thermal insulation. Tenants and residents face higher fuel costs and less warm, less comfortable homes. Solving this is a critical priority for Glasgow. So together with colleagues at Glasgow and Strathclyde University and Southside Housing Association, the Council undertook a collaborative project to refurbish a typical eight-flat pre-1919 tenement uh, built from standstone to Enerfit standard. The project monitored the design, specification and build stages and identified barriers and solutions to meeting the desired standard. The learning from this project will inform our efforts to develop a comprehensive approach to transforming our city's existing homes to meet the climate challenge. It's been said that the climate battle will be won or lost in cities. In 2019, Glasgow declared a climate and ecological emergency and has an ambition to become a carbon neutral city by 2030. Promoting better buildings and sustainable homes and are integral to meet this goal. The housing transformations underway in Glasgow show what can be achieved. We must all reimagine and reshape how we live, work and learn within our communities. As we did, once did, it's our hope that in sharing Glasgow's experience, partners can draw hope, confidence and inspiration to propel their change because ultimately, better homes benefit us all.
thank you for listening. Oh, I just noticed that you've uh, turned the other camera on, so I'll just stay seated. Um, our next speaker is uh, Julio Vos Williamson, a uh, doctor indeed. Uh, he was at Edinburgh Napier University at the time of the Icebox Challenge in Glasgow, but has since moved to Edinburgh University. So over to you. Thank you very much, Georgia. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julio Bross Williamson. Um, I'm from the University of Edinburgh uh, School of Engineering. And um, during the summer, um, I uh, engaged in the Icebox Challenge um, for this journey um, of the design over to um, the, 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 the students and, and how they could uh, be involved in, in both the design and also the construction phase. Of the of the ice boxes, um, so this is this is a problem um, that we face in a lot of the built environment courses um, and uh, and teaching, um, especially here in 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 Britain and Scotland, where there's a big emphasis around the design, but not so much on that journey on how we build and how we deliver energy efficient buildings. Um, so um, it's. This, this challenge was not only looking at the energy efficiency of buildings, but also looking at how our students could be better informed and, and trained in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this process. So looking at uh, preparing a future build uh, and, and built environment students and providing the tools for them to engage and deliver um, designs and, and, and finished product um, in terms of, of, of housing, etc. Um, and not only having to focus on the design, uh, but also have that, that involvement in the, the construction process. Um, and also looking at low carbon building and the fabric first approach, looking at the efficiency of the envelope. Um, so it's very important for the design process to be paired with the strategic planning um, followed by the explanation of the design to, to, uh, to our, our team, the project management of that, and efficient construction stages over to a low carbon uh, building and some future uh, engaged uh, leaders in the built environment. So there was a series of tools available during this process. Um, we focused very much on timber technology learning and, and, and how that could be at the forefront in the learning process. Um, and for that, we had um, a support by the City and Regional Deal uh, in Edinburgh, um, also UFI Votec um, and the Centre for Offsite Construction at Napier University, uh, which created this timber technology uh, pathway to, to really bring those, those built environment students over to this process of, of design and construction. So this challenge, this Icebox Challenge, uh, presented ourselves with the opportunity of creating a student competition to have all these skills involved um, where we, we invited Built Environment school, uh, students from Scotland to uh, submit designs for the two boxes, um, one of them Passive House and the other one to the Scottish Building uh, Regulations, and select uh, within those uh, a winning design that would be constructed and built uh, following that process. We had uh, 10 entries um, from uh, universities in Scotland um, and three winners. Uh, the top three winners were going to present the, the designs to, to, to the judges, uh, compiled from um, in the International Passive House Association, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, uh, the Glasgow Institute of Architects, Napier University and John Gilbert Architects. Um, and uh, the first place um, was going to go on to the next stage to build the actual boxes uh, with uh, ourselves. The winners were Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen um, and they presented a very interesting design um, that tried to integrate um, vernacular uh, uh, aspects and, and, and elements of, of Scotland, um, colours, colour schemes um, and, and, and shapes and, and also the use of local materials. So the use of timber technology and timber um, derived materials was, was at the centre, at the core of this, where we had a volumetric structure that was insulated with wood, wood fibre uh, material and, um, and local um, materials uh, from, from, from around Scotland and, and Glasgow. 
So the boxes were delivered in a record timeline um, in just under six weeks, where we engaged the, uh, with the students to deliver these and to, um, to understand obviously some of the, the, the processes around that from the, cons from the design over to the actual build. Uh, and the students really learnt that process very nicely, um, which is something they lack a lot during their studies. Transport was also an issue um, and, and how to, to, to project manage and, and deliver these boxes in time. Um, so this, this has been a, a really good uh, and interesting kind of journey, um, taking these students and the design uh, within this size box challenge. So I'll pass over to the next speaker, if I may. Thank you so much, Julio. Uh, so our next speaker uh, from the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre is Lisa Dean, and she'll be talking about their involvement in the project and a few of the other things they get up to. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, firstly, thank you to the International Passive House Association for inviting me to speak today. Um, but more importantly, thank you for inviting us to be part of such an inspirational and impactful public installation. When we were first approached by Julio about this project, we were hugely excited um, by the opportunities this could bring to Scotland. This project has far-reaching impact from the students who were involved in the design and the build stages, but also um, to the industry partners who put in so much through donations, and most importantly to the public who actually had the chance to, and the opportunity to view this live and understand really what the true benefits of passive house buildings can offer from both a comfort perspective, but also in reducing our carbon emissions. I've been a part of Construction Scotland Innovation Centre for five years and I lead a team of future skills managers, or that's what they used to be called. Um, that team is there to address skills gaps and skills mismatches that exist within construction at the moment. However, we've re recently renamed and, and redefined our team because the term future was also mistaken quite often for something that needed to be done at some undefined point in time, something that wasn't needing for action now, but actually we do need that action now. So we now want to make that impact today. So what we have now is a team of impact managers, the Innovation Centre, who really focus on Scotland's built environment and the skills that are required in that environment. Um, the focus of the work sits across four key themes. It includes retrofitting opportunities, modern methods of, of construction, digital uh, and sustainability. Um, CSIC is one of seven innovation centres set up in Scotland. We focus on areas of high economic growth. An innovation centre programme covers many areas. It includes data, digital healthcare, aquaculture, just to name a few of them. But we sit in a really unique space um, where we connect academia and industry and the public sector. And our role is to help tackle um, the big challenges that are faced by each of the industries. Our success is derived from the work we do with partners to articulate problems and to find these solutions. The Icebox Challenge is a perfect example of the opportunity that such collaboration can offer. The core project team represented here today includes Glasgow City Council, who had the vision to bring this project to Scotland, Julio, who represents the academic institutes um, and the training of the next generation of the workforce, but it also includes Passive House Trust and Passive House Community and International Passive House Association, where they provide the knowledge and the partnerships and the expertise that's required in this field to really drive it forward. Oh, there we go. CSIC, we see ourselves as a beacon of innovation for the built environment. And we focus our work to ensure that the sector is more sustainable and it meets critical net zero targets through innovative processes and products, but also through skills. Today, I want to talk to you about the skills opportunities that the Icebox Challenge brought. It was a unique opportunity and project in Scotland, and it gave students the opportunity to learn low carbon construction and, and gain practical hands-on experience at the Innovation Factory. They participated in the live builds of these boxes that they'd actually designed themselves. And it was our pleasure to host the students um, and work with them every day to overcome the hurdles and challenges that they faced in bringing their designs to life. Those challenges Julio talked on around logistics, around materials, around making sure they had everything they needed when they needed it, and, and, and looking at how they operated in a real life environment. The exposure to the practical elements of constructing boxes brought the whole new dynamic to what would now hopefully define their future careers. This, along with the opportunity to exhibit their work in the centre of Glasgow, is an experience that will remain with them throughout their lives. It's my hope that they carry with them the knowledge that they've gained through this project into their chosen careers and drive a positive culture of sustainable buildings in Scotland. It's well documented that the construction sector in Scotland faces a growing skills gap 
and needs to recruit an additional 5,250 workers each year just to meet the predicted demand. Um, to compound this challenge, there are around 400,000 skilled construction workers between the ages of 50 and 65 who are all likely to retire in the next 15 years, placing further emphasis on the need to attract new talent to the industry. Projects such as this one um, demonstrates the career opportunities that are available for young people and what the built environment can hopefully do to attract them. I believe that the climate emergency will be a major factor that influences demand for skills and it influence, uh, hopefully it will attract that talent. So for me, we're at the start of a really exciting new chapter. As we transition from net zero carbon, we need more skilled people working in this industry to help us achieve the common goal. The skill, uh, Scot Scotland's Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan launched um, at the end of 2020, and it set out some of the actions required, and it highlighted a series of priority areas um, that will require new green skills. Um, construction, as well as agriculture, transport, manufacturing and energy were among the core sectors identified as having critical contributions to achieving that net zero. CSIC is already delivering a range of skills initiatives for people at different stages of their career. These include low carbon learning programme, which launched this morning, um, as focus on retrofit and energy standards. And also we look at passive house standards. Um, I'm about to show you a video in a second about their passive house and practice programme. But before I do that, we, talk, we also run a Built Environment Masters programme where we work with students who are at postgraduate level to kind of bring them together with industry so that they get this hands-on practical experience so they understand the challenges involved in a live building project before they leave university and go on to join their career. So our Passive House and Practice programme will aim to upskill 600 individuals but actually is more likely to upskill around 1,000 individuals in this year. That was initially set out. It's funded through Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Government um, and the National Transition Training Fund. And it really focuses on training construction workers and tradespeople in passive house standards. And hopefully it will continue to upskill the construction workforce in the coming years. I'll play you a short video that will give you some more information on this. And for any of you who are interested in seeing a bit more about that, the Passive House rigs are on in exhibitions and open tours for the rest of COP, so there'll be time to book onto spaces by tomorrow if you're still interested. But finally, it's our ambition to see this type of training mainstreamed. We want to see it in the education system because the time for change is now. We keep hearing this statement and actually it's very true. Um, so yeah, what, what, what we need is these types of skills to drive that transformational change and to deliver us a net zero built environment. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We're now going to turn over to our final speaker for today. Last but certainly not least is Sarah Lewis, who runs policy uh, for the Passive House Trust here in the UK. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. I'm just putting a timer on to make sure I don't run over, because I'm very enthusiastic about this talk. At um, so yes, my name is Sarah Lewis, I'm Research and Policy Director at the UK Passive House Trust and we are delighted to be here supporting this event today and over the summer. It's a really great initiative. Um, 
And it's so important to us because we know that our buildings in the UK, so I'm just going to give a little bit of the context to the UK and how the challenge and passive house fits into that context. So we know in the UK that our buildings emit about 27% of our CO2 emissions and 18% alone come from our homes, which is a huge portion. So it's really an area where we need to do a lot better. And we know that by building efficiently, as has been demonstrated by this icebox, challenge, we're creating buildings which are more resilient, more comfortable and healthier to be in. So we're not asking people to dramatically change the way they design buildings. You can see from the boxes earlier that they they look the same. So it's not about aesthetics. It's not about a huge change. We're just asking the industry to do what it already does, but just do it better with more care and attention to detailing to deliver buildings which are truly low energy. So when we look at the greenhouse gas emissions from buildings in the UK across the last decade, it's a bit of a depressing picture because actually you can see there's been no significant reductions in emissions over the last decade. And that plays out in the energy performance certificates which were lodged for all new dwellings over the same period. So the last decade, you can see almost a complete flat line in terms of the energy improvements that we're seeing in the design of our new buildings. So um, really, we're in a position where we can't continue that trend. We know from the recent IPCC report that the trajectory needs to be very steep and it needs to be in a very uh, quick that we start to deliver uh, a step change. So this is just going to look at the energy balance uh, of a typical home, and then I'm going to compare it with a passive house building in the UK. So you've got the losses on the left, and we lose uh, heat from our buildings in a manner of ways through the walls, through the roof, through the windows and doors, and through uncontrolled drafts and leaks in the building. Then you've got the gains. Now the gains on the right have to balance those losses to maintain a comfortable internal environment, a healthy home for our occupants. And you have some free gains, so that's the internal gains, which is us sitting here um, in, and being in our homes and using appliances and technology. And also you get free heat from the sun, so solar gains. But all the rest, all of that pink bar there, um, is the input that's required from a heating system in a standard building. Now, that top section there is actually the part which we didn't even account for in our design uh, calculations. In the UK at the moment, monitoring shows that we've got about a 60% performance gap in our buildings. So that means our buildings are using 60% more energy to heat them than we expect them to at design stage. So there's a disconnect there. Passive House, by contrast, reduces those losses. So the principles of a fabric first approach means you're really focusing on the building fabric. So you're having a very high quality fabric. Um, and as was shown in the demonstration buildings with the ice box, you're also taking a lot more care about how those elements come together to make sure you've not got thermal bridging through those elements. And you're also making sure that the building is draft free so it's comfortable throughout the year. And this means that in a passive house buildings, those free uh, gains that you've got through the occupants, through um, the technology in the building and through the solar gains actually account for most of the heating in the, in the building. And there's just a small amount which is required to be provided by the heating system. And there's no performance gap. And we know that through monitoring of completed buildings, passive house buildings, that they effectively eliminate the performance gap. And this means that what we have in reality is a net zero ready building when we design to the passive house standard. We've reduced the losses to such an extent that the building is very energy efficient. It supports a decarbonized grid. And it means that if somebody wanted to provide all of that energy the building needs on site, it is possible to do so. By contrast, our building regulation compliant building um, would need a whopping 28 solar panels on a typical um, two story, uh, three bedroom home, which just for reference would be about twice the roof area. So it's an impossible uh, to, to manage to get a net zero, a truly net zero building um, with the current building standards once you take into account that performance gap. And you do often hear this argument about carbon in buildings. People say, well, we could just wait for the grid to decarbonize. Once we have a zero carbon grid, our buildings using that grid will also be zero carbon. The issue with that is that while our wind and tide and solar energy do exceed our requirements, our ability to harvest that energy is not infinite. The grid has limits. 
And it doesn't just have limits in terms of how much we're able to harvest. All that harvesting has an implication in terms of the financial impact to generate all of it, and there's a carbon impact to building all of that infrastructure. We did some research to look at the cost for building passive house over building regulations compared to the cost of generating new renewable energy. And you can see here <coughs> that, <coughs> excuse me, you can see here that the passive house to, is sort of three to four pence per kilowatt hour saved, whereas generating energy in any of these other renewable means is more expensive per kilowatt. So saving a kilowatt is cheaper than uh, generating it. So it's a win-win situation. Plus we're getting these buildings which are much more comfortable. And it's not just about how much energy we can have over the course of a year. Actually, there is a limit to what peak load uh, the grid is able to deliver. So on that graph there, the orange and turquoise bars are the current thermal load on the grid from just our houses for heating and hot water. So that's the, the orange and the turquoise. And the blue is showing you what the peak um, capacity is for the electricity grid at the moment. And as you can see, even in 2030 and then again in 2050, the grid will not have the capacity if we simply move all our buildings onto a renewable grid. And that would be assuming that we could have all of it just for our housing, but we need to share that renewable grid with transport, with, other, uh, with industry and with non-domestic buildings, of course, as well. So we have to think about how much we can really apportion to our, uh, to our homes and to our buildings. Buildings. Demand reduction has to be a part of the picture, both in terms of our new buildings and also the retrofit of our existing buildings. And then to, for me, Passive House is about so much more than just energy. Um, of course, it is a standard which drives uh, really excellent energy performance, but it's also a comfort and health standard. There's a really strong link in the UK between cold homes and poor health, costing the NHS almost a billion pounds a year, with 10,000 people dying as a result of living in cold homes. Whereas passive house uh, buildings are warm and comfortable and healthy, they result in better occupant health and mental well-being, reduced contact with the health services, and a reduced absence from school and work. And then, as was mentioned earlier, they are also the right choice for our changing climate. We know that the stable temperatures uh, maintained within a passive house make the buildings very resilient um, and the right choice for our changing climate. We did some research looking at uh, new build, uh, homes built to the building regulations and tested those against uh, overheating and test metric and they all failed, whereas 89% of the passive house homes passed the overheating test when monitored uh, real life buildings on site. And then finally, I just wanted to end again with this retrofit challenge. So 80% of the buildings which are going to be around in 2050 in the UK already exist today. There's a huge amount of work that is required to upgrade those buildings to get them ready for our net zero future. And Passive House has a range of tools. Enefit was mentioned and there's different levels of Enefits and different approaches that make it widely applicable around the UK. Um, the, UK, the UK Passive House Trust, we're an affiliate um, of the International Passive House Institute um, and we provide a lot of guidance and support for organisations um, looking to build and design to the Passive House standard. All of the research papers that we produce and guidance are available free, they're accessible, they're approachable and they're there to help support the uptake of um, Passive House and these uh, net zero ready buildings. And then we also recently co-authored a new guide from Letty, which is a retrofit guide, again, another excellent free resource for designers and uh, clients. And just so this is my final slide, so just a final kind of note to say that the tools that we need to address the climate emergency exist today. And it feels like often we look to technology in the future, something that's going to come, a magic bullet, but we don't need that. We, we already have the tools we need. Passive House is one of those tools. It creates zero carbon ready buildings that are suitable for a decarbonized grid. So uh, yeah, the, the future is very bright if we look to set Passive House um, as, our, as our building standard for new buildings and Enefit as a standard for renovation projects. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we're now going to see a video from the Icebox Challenge, and then we'll have some time for questions. 
I think the Icebox Challenge is a really important demonstrator of challenge-based learning and just all the benefits that, that can bring. Um, especially nowadays in the built environment, we know that we have a lot of drivers. We want buildings to be more sustainable, more, more energy efficient. We also need people who, who know how to work collaboratively, who know how to solve problems together with other people who may have um, different types of experiences. The Xbox Challenge uh, started with conversation about a year and a half ago where we wanted to uh, embed the knowledge of energy efficiency uh, within teaching and, and, uh, and also the students within the built environment. So we were very keen to, to have the passive house standard uh, brought into the curriculum. Its main objective was to compare uh, and con contrast between the Scottish building regulations and the passive house uh, standard which uses more insulation and has less tolerances for thermal bridging. And crucially the boxes are to hold one tonne of ice each and then after three weeks displayed in St Enoch Square in Glasgow the amount of ice remaining will be compared and contrasted and then data will be drawn to suggest how insulation has um, affected the thermal efficiency of the boxes. The Icebox Challenge is one of the examples of the Timber Technology Engineering and Design Pathway Project. Um, so the Timber TED project, as we call it for short, is part of the bigger picture in terms of how do we actually upskill the next generation of timber technologists, engineers and designers. The winning group were able to come into the Construction Scotland Innovation Factory and start to actually uh, assemble and build the, the two ice boxes during a four, four week period uh, in preparation for the public display in St Enough Square. Um, this was facilitated mainly by the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. We tried to make it very environmentally friendly and also be interesting and show to the public that Passive House also can look interesting and doesn't have to be all standard boxes. It's been actually really exciting to see the module come together and to just look at it and think, wow, um, I did this. <laughs>public awareness of Passive House and this is getting people talking and asking questions. For me that's that's what being in the city centre is really all about so that's it's having maximum impact. We're, we honestly feel very very uh, proud to have achieved that because at one point we thought ah oh, this might not be completed but yet here we are. The results are pretty clear. The Passive House box has got 120 kilos of ice um, and the building standards box actually lost its all, all of its ice on Monday. The whole purpose of having the boxes displayed in public um, was really to, to bring people to the knowledge of the Passive House standard and also to understand the differences between what we have in Scotland as a, as a kind of bare minimum uh, in, in energy efficiency and construction um, compared with more efficient uh, standards of, of, of build and design. Um, and to really get that visual effect of, of performance, of, of energy use and, and, and different temperatures uh, inside these boxes that would really determine the rate of, of how that melting of ice would, would, would happen. We've got a lot of momentum now thanks to the success of the Icebox Challenge and we're going to use that to create more challenge-based activities which are all about timber technology, engineering and design. Certainly myself and the rest of the, the team really believe that Passive House is the future. You know, for, for so many benefit other than um, the people's health, people's reduced energy bills, but the impact we can make for, for, for helping against climate change. So, um, yeah, I th I'm really pleased that you know, we've got, we're going to have this experience behind us, uh, that we can go into the world of work and, and you know, have this hands-on experience about Passive House and show the rest of Scotland that, um, yeah, we can do this.
apparently I don't need to press it. Good that that was just caught on screen. Um, so can I just get back to the PowerPoint, please? While we wait for that, I'll just talk to you about uh, that wonderful video. We do have a short version of it and, of course, the long version. So if you would like to use it or you're interested in holding your own Passive House uh, Icebox Challenge, then uh, just get in touch. So now that the PowerPoint is working again, um, and we've used our favorite photo from the Icebox Challenge, of course, of this adorable dog enjoying better buildings. Um, I'd like to mention that next year, the wonderful Scottish Icebox Challengers will be making a trip further south and will be planted in Newcastle in the spring. Uh, we'll also hopefully be adding the patios, which we use for extra shading to them. Um, and then after that, we hope to do a Passive House Roadshow throughout the UK. So if you're interested in supporting that, please do get on board. Uh, we also have confirmation that we will be doing the Passive House Icebox Challenge in Sydney, Australia um, in February, which is, of course, for those of you who are familiar with Australia, uh, the month at which it becomes burning hot and everybody's quite miserable. Um, I'm from Australia, so it's fine, I can say it. Um, and then um, the last thing is that we have the next icebox challenge actually taking place right now. We have an icebox challenge taking place in Santiago de Chile, um, and today we will be presenting the results of that challenge live in the Buildings Pavilion at the Icebox Crossing Borders event. So if you are in interested in finding out how Passive House uh, is done in hot climates versus the cool temperate climate that we experience here, then do join us for that. I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody for joining us today. You can find out more about the Icebox Challenge on iceboxchallenge.org. We also collect all of the information on Icebox Challenges worldwide there, so you can find out more about the challenges across climates, across borders, and across the years as we plan to continue this project. You can also, of course, always find out more information about the Passive House standard at our website or follow us on the many channels of social media um, for perhaps just general COP information or anything else. So we still have five minutes um, and I wanted to allow for questions. I see that I've not got any here on Slido, but that might have something to do with the fact that I didn't mention it to you. But does anybody in the audience have any questions about the Icebox Challenge? I see the tech group is just running around with a microphone. <laughs> just over here. Yes, thank you. It was a good presentation. Do you have any icebox challenges in Africa? Not yet. But, of course, that is the goal overall. We want to bring the challenge uh, worldwide in different climate zones. And there's no reason not to. So if we had the right partners, we could definitely work on uh, bringing the Icebox Challenge to, to the continent. We've just got to find the right time and place. Okay, thank you. Just move it down the line. Hi. Um, I'm going to be this guy with a couple of questions, so apologies in advance. Excellent. Um, one... We're from uh, the Royal Corporation of Architects in Scotland and are definitely keen to get involved to that roadshow um, when it's going around the various areas of the UK. Um, we're quite proud from Aberdeen chapter that the Robert Gordon team won. Phil's from the Glasgow Institute, so they were our supporters as well. Um, but it's also tapping into what some of you guys were saying about the, the learning opportunities. And I, I'm very much of the opinion that just when you've finished uni doesn't mean you're stopping to learn or at least you shouldn't be with the way things are going. Um, and I was hoping there would be some opportunities for collaboration between, you know, like architects and architectural societies and in, in, across the country with you guys when you're doing really innovative stuff with timber. And I think there's projects for locally grown timber and things like that to really bring it on. So it kind of all links in with Passive House and sustainable technology. But I think it's really exciting what you guys are doing and great, basically. Thank you. Yeah, there's definitely opportunities to get involved. Um, 
Exactly like the division centre, I've just about to look our launch this morning, the low carbon learning strategy, which and um, more partners we can get involved in that. And it is about work, people who are already in work um, and people who are kind of in the industry who are looking to upskill and reskill and kind of new, new kind of sustainable skills that are going to need for the future. I'm just curious with uh, with passive house and the, like I know in the traditional buildings were, are not very well sealed. Passive house is a much better sealed building, and that ceiling itself, uh, I suppose, uncontrolled ceiling can cause difficulties in the current climate that we're in with COVID. I'm just wondering, has anyone has any? research being done as to the effect of having like a passive house with having very controlled ventilation and what the impacts are of that from a health perspective in relation to COVID-19. Do you know has anything been done with that? Yeah. Um, Sarah, I believe the Trust did some research into this, no? Yeah, well, we've, we've been involved in sort of data collection on lots of different projects. And one of the things in post-occupancy evaluation that's monitored on passive house projects as well as other buildings is the CO2 levels in buildings, which we know has a, is a really good uh, metric to look at when you're looking at indoor air quality because it's easy to measure and it's good proxy for other things such as um, COVID um, transfer and things in buildings. So we know from that research that schools, for example, where um, COVID is a concern and ventilation levels in schools are a concern, that in passive house schools, the CO2 levels are kept um, well below the uh, 1,500 parts per million or even 1,000 parts per million, which is the recommendations. Whereas in non-passive house buildings, more traditional buildings, um, the CO2 levels in the winter can go up to 5,000 parts per million or above. So we know that those are very um, where you've got uncontrolled ventilation, you're relying on natural ventilation, which basically means opening windows, which people don't want to do in the winter. You have this buildup over time of CO2 within buildings. And it's the same in domestic buildings as well. We see CO2 levels rising in buildings which don't have uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, which is a requirement for all passive house buildings. So passive house buildings, because of that, are inherently very healthy buildings. So we know that they create a very healthy indoor uh, air quality. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to wrap up now, as I know the EU team wants to disinfect everything. Um, so a big thank you to our audience today, online and in person. Uh, thank you for the wonderful questions. And we'll be around to talk to you one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions. And otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for participating in the Icebox Challenge Glasgow. And thank you for offering us the opportunity to share the results of this public experiment. Thank you.